you have now exited host mode. You have now entered sicko mode. That's a song, right? By Travis Scott, the rapper. I gotta say, when I heard there was a rapper, I know this, I know I sound like an old man, but when I heard there was a rapper called Travis Scott, I was like, well, that's kind of goofy, but not having a rap name at all? Okay, I can see that as a power move. Like, there are porn stars, for example, who use their own names. Power move. Like, I don't even need a handle. Uh, but apparently that isn't his real name. It's an actual rap name. And it's just a guy's name that isn't his. To, this, to me, this makes no sense. And it definitely tells me that whatever is going on with the youth today, I don't really understand it. Yes, yes, yes. Everyone's mad about the Empire mug. Deal with it. Okay, I'm sorry. I know people are mad about it. And it is just literally colonialism in a symbol. But the St. Andrews, the St. George... It's visually pleasing to me. So, okay, I'm glad to know that I'm not the only person who didn't know that that wasn't his real name. Because, come on, what the hell? And his real name was Jacques? And he went with Travis. I don't understand these kids today, man. I don't get it. No, I mean, like, come on, you got, like... Yes, the Confederate flag is the symbol it is because of, you know, more than anything, the failure to reconstruct the South. But it's also popular because it looks good. Like, people put it on boogie boards and, and, and on uh, T-shirts and shit partially because it looks cool. It definitely looks cooler than the American flag with its stupid asymmetry and the big blob of stars in one corner. Sloppy. And... The Confederate flag, as some people might know, is not the stars and bars. The stars and bars is the Confederate, the, the, the flag of the nation of the Confederate States of America, which is a three, star, three bars and some stars on one side, and it's uh, just sort of like a, a, a uh, homunculus version of the American flag. Nobody waves that ever. You ever see anybody wave that? Nobody's interested in that shit. It's that fucking St. Andrew's cross. It's the symmetry. The stars... Sweeping across all axis. It looks better. It was a design victory. Same thing with the swastika. Swastika was a, was a good design. No, I, I, the thing, someone asked about Posadism. I mean, it's not a tendency. It's a coping mechanism. It's a, it's a bit. And there's nothing wrong with having a bit. It's just your bit shouldn't take over your life. Unless you're Jacob Wall. Unless you have that ability, don't let your bit take over your life. Otherwise, you end up falling into the abyss. The most boring conspiracy theory is, like I said in the last one, the moon landing. Boring. Boring. And apparently impossible. Like, they shot the thing on 30 frames per second, which would have made it impossible to do the things that he, they did to make it look like they made it look in terms of because of the atmosphere difference with the 30 frame per second camera. So they would have had to invent something and then keep it hidden for 30 years. And also what? So that they can win a, win, a, win a headline war with the Soviet Union? Come on. I mean, the Soviet Union got a, a man in space first and a fucking uh, 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 satellite in space first. Did they win the Cold War because of that? And moon landing stuff, it gets folded into flat Earth too much too, which to my mind is like the er dummy expression of like lumpen alienation in this country like and apparently there's a really good youtube video that connects flat earth to the q and i think and i do want to watch it i haven't seen it yet but i will be watching it uh and yeah no flat earth is the basis for all this like anti-vax at all it's like it's a it's a fundamental like 
unifying concept of life or of like life on earth as it is understood, you know, when we talk about human understanding. And because it is not in front of you deciding that everything is made up, that you have to, you have to be a certain kind of dummy to have that kind of response to the real alienations of life. I don't blame you, I guess. You can't really control being a dummy, but it is exclusively the domain of dummies. They're willing to just decide that everything they see is a fantasy because one thing they see doesn't correspond to something that requires very little in terms of scientific understanding or knowledge to get the notion of a of the Earth being a fucking round spheroid thingy. But the problem is you can't see it with your naked eyes. You have to trust science, and people don't trust anything. They're wildly, wildly alienated from every mechanism that they depend on. But they still live within it. And so they have to create narratives to explain this. And one of the ones that have been used is, no, no, the Earth is fl isn't flat. It, it's the Earth is flat because it looks flat to me. Because anything that requires an explanation beyond that is done by those people, like I was talking about, like the media and like science. Science who are on the other team, who are, who are part of the conspiracy to keep me from realizing life as it should be lived. Because you can't fucking imagine co cooperating with people to make the world a better place. No, you need to just confront the people who are secretly preventing it from happening through, through uh, manufactured reality. When in truth, the manufactured reality that's making your life miserable is things like private property. Things like fucking uh, uh, the wage system. Sur the very concept of surplus fucking value. How about that? But they don't have any investment in these institutions, in science, in, in math. It, because what? They went to school, they got a half-assed, barely, barely there education that basically provides no real grounding in why anything happens. Like, you go to school for the most part, and maybe that's changing, but certainly when I went to school, you learn discrete facts. They are not embedded into, like, a greater web of understanding. So you don't even know why you believe them. You just know that you're supposed to. And for most people, that's supposed to, that authority, it's enough. But if you have a specific alienation from maybe, like, your brain doesn't work in a way that allows you to abstract yourself to the required demands of science, but even beyond that, you were never even engaged. Because we just tell people, like, you're supposed to believe that. There was a viral tweet of, or viral video a few weeks ago of some young woman going, I don't think math is real because how would you do that? How would you, would, how would you go from nothing to, like, algebra or, like, calculus or something like that? How could you go from nothing to an iPhone? Like, how, how can you get that complexity out of the simplicity of, like, just numbers being added up? And the thing is, there's an answer to that, but nobody ever gets it in school. You get nothing. You just get thrown this shit thrown at you all because it's supposed to let, make you function in the world. And then you get out into the world and you're not being able to function at all. It doesn't help at all. It doesn't provide you with a map of meaning anywhere. So why should you believe the specific claims? Why should you accept any of it? And I'm saying just that it's the domain of dummies because even if you're alienated from education like I was and like most people are, you are able to get certain concepts enough that you don't need to have authority stand in for the understanding of them. Like, you can, even with the haphazard public education or, you know, uh, scam-ass private education we get, we're able to connect these concepts to a chain of reasoning that maybe doesn't go down to, like, the basis of it, but goes close enough to get us past just because they told you so. But some people don't have that. They can't do it. Or their education didn't provide them even with enough of a context to make the leap. And they respond by going, yeah, no, uh, Earth's flat. Earth is fucking flat. And the moon landing had to be fucking fake, because if the moon's real, then the Earth isn't flat. I mean, I remember I had a fucking Jehovah's Witness as a geology teacher in public high school. 
He believed that, uh, I believe he, one time he told us that, uh, that JFK was killed by demons. And the proof of that was that there was a, apparently a big UFO flap in Texas right before the assassination, which, according to him, and according to his cosmology, meant it was demons, because that's what UFOs are. And he was my geology teacher. And so, but our only answer, our only answer to this horror is to ridicule people because no one can do the work and no one can, no one more, more importantly, nobody can get a buy-in of trust because everyone is trying to sell you something. And so nobody trusts anybody in, except you make some like emotional connection. Like you see Trump and Trump is so much like you in a certain way that you invest him with like total trust because how could you not trust him? He's clearly authentically you in a meaningful way. You recognize something in Trump that is in you that is so deep that it means that you have to trust whatever he says because it's basically you talking. And so then they use that as the, as the anchor and then they can figure out what, why everyone else is lying to them, which they have to be. And that's, where, uh, and that's what they're like. And that's why they'll never be convinced. Global warming? It'll get cooler soon. Watch me. Trust me. Uh, what does he say about coronavirus? It, one day, it'll be gone. It'll be over. It'll be like magic. I also had, uh, I also had a history teacher who looked just like a grown-up Ralph Wiggum. Like, shaped exactly the same and the same barcode haircut. Uh, and he, in science, and, I, and the thing is, at the time, I was kind of like not really paying attention. I didn't really, I wasn't very engaged with, with this, with school. I mean, like I wanted to get good grades, but like history class was not hard for me. That's the kind of thing like, yeah, no, I just read the thing and I tell you what you want to hear. And this guy showed a lot of movies. And now looking back on it, with only a few years, I was able to realize later, I was like, oh, this guy was propagandizing us. Uh, and not like on a, in a, even on a political level, at a religious level. He showed us Ben-Hur. And then he showed us something that was very weird. It was a video of a guy dressed up like a fucking, uh, like a Bavarian, like in a fucking lederhosen, marching around in the Alps, looking at art, explaining how the Roman Empire fell because they had a finite worldview. Uh, and... Uh, later, I found out, uh, uh, reading Rick Perlstein, actually, uh, he described this series of books by this, uh, by this series of films by this guy, Francis Schaeffer, who was like one of the, the seminal figures in creating the modern political evangelical uh, Protestant movement in this country, had this series of, it, of, of, of films that were hugely successful and shown all over America, uh, in, I think, theaters and also on television. And reading the description, I was like, Oh, he was showing us that shit in public fucking history class. And I had the classic in a history class, a different history class. I had a different year. I had the classic situation where the history teacher was the football coach. And we just watched a lot of movies. Like we watched The Grapes of Wrath. Watched uh, Sergeant York. No, Lincoln's death was not an inside job. Shut up. It wasn't Edward Stanton. That's so stupid. There's no proof of it. I don't get when people yell the same questions over and over again. I understand you're trying to get me to see it, but man, it makes me feel like people are having a nervous breakdown. There is a theory that it was the Jesuits. That was a popular nativist, anti-Catholic uh, feeling in the in the during the uh, Gilded Age. It is amazing how anti-Catholic sentiment, anti-Catholic political sentiment in this country is almost identical to Islamophobia. I'm dappled right now. It's nice though because it's it's getting crispy so not even the sun is bothering me the way it used to. 
It's fall. Man, it's fall in September. Oh, I feel so blessed. Too bad about the second, the other half of the country. Uh, I, I send my sympathies to them, but uh, sorry. Hashtag couldn't be me. Okay, somebody asked about ego death. And I realize I've actually never talked about that on the stream before. I definitely have experienced ego death one time. That was not uh, the time that like was early in quarantine where I had my Satori moment that like realigned my spiritual axis. That was much milder. That was really just like an intellectual epiphany, a moment. Uh, this was earlier, and, I, and, and it was less powerful for me because I didn't really know what was happening at the time or even after for a long time, so I couldn't really contextualize it. It was just insanely weird. And, 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 uh, and I, I just didn't know my brain could do that. Uh, and what happened was, is that, for worst of all, it ha started with, at that point, my experience with psychedelics was such that I, uh, re I had sort of come to terms with the idea that the cartoon version of getting, of dropping acid or, or doing mushrooms that you see in media, where you see like turn, things turn into other things and you have apparitions of things that aren't actually there, I had kind of come to the realization, oh, that's probably just made up. Like in reality, it's just sort of a sense, it's, it's like a, just a, a, a sensitivity more than anything and like sometimes that bleeds over into like seeing symbols and movements and stuff but it's not transportive that way first thing that happened was that i had cartoon hallucinations as in someone i was talking to their head they looked like a bird like the head was like a a, a cartoon drawn bird and i'm like oh snap at one point like black things are coming out of my fingers and uh uh tendrils and I see, I see a room, I see into a room, and it looks like a dollhouse room, like I'm in fucking hereditary, like actual intense hallucinatory stuff. And then over time, uh, what happened is, is like the hallucination took over my sight to the point that like I wasn't even really seeing anything in front of my eyes at all. I was just seeing patterns uh, and lights. And then I just felt the sensation of falling. I, not not, not uh, scared at all, because I was like lying on my back. So I just felt like I was being pulled down, but not falling. Like it was, it was at no point was I scared. It, I actually just kind of felt like this expansion and then the lights took over and that's where the ego dies in the sense that there is no more remembering it. You know what I mean? Like it is just a spot. It's like a warm glow. Cause I remember this precise moment before I got to it when like the light overtook me and of course, I remember coming back from it, but like there's that space that is, it's eternity. It's, it's that background radiation of unity and, and, and eternal oneness that we are all just a few degrees away from perceiving at any given moment. But the craziest part is that coming back took me a long time so like I came into consciousness but it came it was back to just being me conscious of shapes and colors and not really even feeling like I had a body or that I was seeing anything and slowly the room took it resolution but my body was not did not like have an end point I was on a couch and at one point I felt that I, I wanted to move my arm and in the process of moving my arm I had to come back to being aware that my couch was separate from, or the couch was separate from my arm. Like I had to pull the arm off, not in a sense that like I could see, but that I could feel at a level of like, of, of, of convincingness. Like it felt that way. It felt like I was re-territorializing my arm away from the couch because previously they had been one thing. And so that's, that's what that was. I had to separate my arm from the couch. And then slowly over more time, more things took definition and separation. And at the time, it was just sort of like, holy crap, 
well, that's ego death, but I didn't really know much more about it. It didn't have like a lingering spiritual thing like this did. It happened later. It's because I didn't know what I was experiencing. And now I feel like I actually do get what I was experiencing. I was getting to that point. I was getting to that awareness, that point of awareness, whereby you are no longer recognizing distinctions in time and space and therefore are in an eternal space, i.e. nirvana, heaven, whatever you want to call it. I don't know. There's the, the words you're trying to get are always going to be clumsy translations that are. you first need to make sense to yourself, and then you have to tell them to other people. They have different definitions. It's, 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 it's ineffable. It's as inexplicable as it is. It, you can't describe it any more than you can. Just, you can't describe it to yourself. You sure as hell can't describe it to someone else because the things you use to describe it cannot be applied because that requires distinctions, and there are no distinctions. And that if that's reality, and this is all sort of a refracted illusion created by, you know, uh, our species overdevelopment of our sensory apparatus, then we can detach ourselves from the fear of separateness and the fear of, of attack against us as, an indistinct, as a distinct element. Because we know, or at least we can feel, that we are not distinct. I mean, we still have to live our lives, but we can live them in a way that is not always being tacked towards a selfish uh, 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 craving of pleasure and a terrified repulsion at the idea of pain to protect a thing that is essentially illusory. Pr to protect, it's like a rampart around an, an, an empty keep. It's like the dark tower. You get inside there, you just keep going up. There's nobody in there. And then you open the door and then you're back pursuing the man in black across the desert. But maybe this time you've got the Horn of Eld. Uh, so, yeah, that's what the feeling was. And now, like, I was only able to come. And at 40, it feels like I took way too long to get there to a moment of like basic peace with my place in the universe. And, but part of me is annoyed with myself for taking so long, but the other part of me is able to recognize that everything that came before me made it possible and in fact made it inevitable. And that nothing I could have changed, there's nothing I could have changed. At every step, my, my actions were determined. And they led me here, which makes me fortunate. And that experience was one of them. Like, if I hadn't had that experience, it would have been much harder to hold on to the feeling I got that second time. Because holding on to it is the only thing that matters. If you, if you feel it, you can't stay there. And you, it's hard to get back there. Like, you can't do a yo-yo thing of, well, I'll just keep pressing the button because then you will dissolve. You won't be able to function and you won't be able to fulfill your, you know your moral duty to your fellow human beings in the same situation. All right, no, I'm not 40. I was just trying, I was using it for a nice round effect. Uh, no, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an Oregon Trail millennial. Oh, God, Dershowitz has a podcast. I cannot wait. Cannot wait for that one. Dershcast. Dersh, who are your guys? Uh, Mark Dutro, Jeffrey Epstein. 
the Brabant Killers, Silvio Berlusconi, Oh, we're not getting a Joe Rogan. We're barely getting an actual debate. We're sure as hell not going to get an awesome ass Joe Rogan debate where they're chewed up in the in the garage. Not gonna, not gonna happen. Not going to happen. I'm afraid, sadly. Sarah Palin's moment has passed. She sold her. She sold her. Heritage, she so, she sold her uh, birthright for a for a fucking Instagram tummy tea endorsement. Uh, Palin is obviously a precursor. She's an important uh, person in like the evolution of the political moment. But she was too much like Trump, sort of like she was she was early, which means she needed to have like had some sort of preternatural instincts to prolong that and make and make hay of it. But because she was as dumb as the moment called for, someone to be completely transparent and to appeal to people on that transparency, like that authenticity, like the stupidity becoming authenticity for certain people. And then, that, and then also, you know, the media part or like the, the, the uh, spectacle part of it and like turning the whole thing into a, into a TV show. Um, but she was so authentically in the moment that she couldn't make the most of it. And so she has to be sort of a precursor figure. Uh, she's gonna have to she just has to sit out there as like, oh yeah, no, she missed her moment, but uh, but you know it couldn't have been any other way for her. She was never gonna make it make it real. It was always gonna be somebody after her. Hell, until Trump won, I thought it was gonna have to be somebody after Trump, and I was like, oh no, we're here now, we're here now, and thanks to thanks in big part to Palin. Yeah, she's John the Baptist, exactly. I was just going to say that. There are no... Uh, somebody's asked who, the, who should be the next Saturday Night Live movie uh, from, a, uh, from a recurring character. SNL, guys, swear to God, SNL really doesn't even have recurring characters anymore. It has recurring premises. Like... The old days when SNL had, you know, your your wacky characters, your your uh, your uh, Bill, your uh, Wayne's Worlds, your church ladies, your Rob the copier guys, some of which became movies. Uh, your ladies men. That was an amazing one. Can't believe they did that. Uh, but current SNL doesn't really have those. There are a few of them, but like they make no impact, and nobody likes them, and they're not. Nobody woo woo woos when they see them, which is the mark of a recurring sketch. Is when the character comes in, everyone's excited because they like the character. Uh, they don't do that anymore. Mostly, what they do is they recycle premises where they take the exact same structure, the same premise of the bit, and then they just slightly reword the jokes, which is sort of what they would do with recurring characters. But at least there was the fact that the character was so uh, popular and so charismatic in some way. That them interacting in slightly different situations produced novelty. There is no spark. It's just the same thing. It's just a mildly pre-chewed cud hunk after going through uh, the multiple chambers of Lorne Michaels' ruminant stomach. So there's nothing they could even do. Yeah, like Black Jeopardy, stuff like that. Like there's no recurring character there. It's just a recurring premise. It's, uh, it, I have to say, it's one of those deals where, yes, yes, the, it was never really good, and it's always presentist in a, in a sort of a uh, hysterical way to, to, to say that SNL is only getting worse. I must say uh, that in recent years, it has gotten worse in appreciable ways. And that's one of them. You know, you could talk about how, uh, how cringe and lame those old uh, recurring characters were, and they were. Uh, at least people are happy to see somebody, you know? Nobody's, nobody's happy to see anybody on that stage now. 
Oh, man. Thankfully, they're not doing Zoom SNL anymore. They're apparently going to come back to the studio. Although, I bet they won't have a live audience. But honestly, I'll take that over. What if they have a laugh track? That'd be funny. The Zoom SNL was so terrible. And it really shows, like, there has to be a limit to hypernormalization. It's called Saturday Night Live. You don't get to just have a bunch of Zoom calls, stitch them together, and say it's Saturday Night Live. And try to act like this is normal. No, just get... Just fucking cancel it until you can make it again. Or cancel it all together. Take it as a sign from God and wrap it up. Don't just d adulterate it into nothing. Kyle Mooney is okay. I guess he's supposed to be the good one there, but um, I'm not even a huge fan of his stuff. It seems very one note. It's like him doing a flat impression a very good impression of an affectless teenager but i don't it's not even a character you know it's like it, it, wayne was a character wayne was yeah this is like a party guy in in suburban chicago is like and kyle mooney's do, deal is basically this is what a flat affect californian like person it, guy is like a young a young millennial youth from the west coast where they don't have affect, where they don't have personality. Uh, but he doesn't have a real name, and if he does, I don't know what it is. It's just, uh, it's not great. And of course, Michael Che and Colin Jost, just some of the worst ever uh, hosts, or uh, Weekend Update guys. Yeah, the four stick hysterectomies, that's, uh, that's terrifying. That's monstr monstrous. Uh, it's the kind of stuff, like a lot of the things recently, there are things that you sort of have in the back of your throat, you kind of know are happening, you know are real, you assume are happening, but you don't know, so you can kind of comfort yourself with that ambiguity, and then they just snap into re reality. It's like, no, the, the, the monster is really under the bed, like this is really happening, we're... We're doing this, and there's no, there's no thing that looks like it's going to come close to stopping it. Uh, and, that's, and that's the really nauseating part. And I do wonder, though, if people really think, like the, the Biden people, the people who think Biden is the moral required choice for every American because of, uh, because of the danger of Trump and how this kind of thing is the, is the moral imperative to vote for him. Do they really think that there's any meaningful thing that Biden's going to do to change that? Like, do they think they're going to dismantle this network of, of, of concentration camps overnight and just release everybody? Do they think that that's possible? I guess it's similar to thinking, do you think Donald Trump's really going to put the trucks, the tanks down Fifth Avenue and arrest all the sickos and hang them from a yard arm? It's impossible, but like, Everything is a fantasy now. So, of course, we can believe in fantasies even more easily because we've ceased to ground politics at all. But anyway, uh, that's an MP. That's not an MP. That's a YP. I really love not having to care about the race. I really love have, having to argue about, with people about whether it's my moral duty to vote for Biden. I love not having that argument again. None of it. it no one has any control over this process. Your your vote is is a, a neurotic fetish object. You're basically frottaging your vote to give yourself a sense of agency to assuage the anxiety of feeling like we're fucking pinwheeling, pinwheeling into hell's open asshole. And so they have to fixate on it. And so they want to fight about whether, what, who should I vote for? Oh, my precious vote, my one vote, who gives a shit?
and you're not coordinating it with anybody. I saw someone, this blew my mind. Someone was, uh, I saw someone on Twitter say, uh, voting is not an individual moral choice. It's a collective action. And I am like, no, it is not. It is maybe it is it is a it is a action that a collective of people pursue, but they pursue it individually. There is no coordination. That's what we do instead of having direct democracy. Is we all just say I or nay, and that's independent of one another. We can try to do stuff like outreach to one another, but that is all secondary. None of that is able to actually influence it to the level where you can. Uh, pursue coordinated activities and so that means your individual joy is that it's just that it's one of literally a hundred million of them thousands of which just get dropped into a toilet and that thing is is that doesn't mean you shouldn't vote voting there's other reasons to vote. Like, hey, maybe my participation in this election could be tactically or strategically useful. Then, now you can actually make an argument, make a decision from there about who to vote for. But you have to like ping that antenna first. You can't start, you, you, there's no reason to start from I'm morally obligated. No, you're not. Maybe you are strategically and uh, tactically motiva uh, motivated. And if that's the case, do it. But you need to examine it through that lens, and then that has to, and then the answer has to be stripped of that emotional energy, because you're you're stripping it down to size. I am voting, I'm participating in this election for this reason, but it's not the whole sum of my political identity. It is not the decision that I will take this day to direct politics to feel like I'm participating in politics. No, it's going to be like the third or fourth most important thing I do that day or that week. You know, union meetings or fucking picket lines or fucking organizing, knocking on doors. That's, that's, and that's what follows from stripping it of that emotional power because then you either, you have a real choice to make. Am I fetishizing the vote because there's truly no other thing to do and that this is all I can do is hold on to this vote or does it keep get me off the hook from having to really do anything that I don't want to do anyway? Like, oh, arguing about voting online and then voting? I love doing those things. Like those, like libs like to say, hey, it's one day. Why can't you take time out to do it? It's like, exactly, it's one day. How, how powerful, how important could it really be? It's one day, hey, you should be doing it every day. And part of people are going to be like, yeah, but I don't want to do it. And like I have said, totally understandable. But you have to ask that question. And then you have to be honest with yourself. And then you will decide what level of political activism is required of you now. But it flows from answering that question. And then you have to cast out the idol of the electorate. You have to, or you have to, ca you have to cast the spirit, the spook, out of voting. And, and see it clearly for what it is. What, when it should be participated in and on what terms. That's why I'm saying don't, don't be electoral. I think electoralism is very important to organize around. And there are specific races and specific times that there is coordinated enough activity to merit your vote being a thing to infuse time with considering or trying to, ex you know, extend. But if the vote is, if the vote is just this, if it's just this act, then you're going to have to do something. Or decide, I don't really want to do anything, I'm going to just game. And you know what? That's better for everybody, because then you'll leave us the fuck alone. And it's one less person yappity yap yapping in people's ear and making it harder for them to hear themselves. Uh, I think the Belden program is the answer. And it is very funny when I saw someone say, LOL, the Belden program, it just looks like it's orthodox Marxism. Uh, yes, correct. That's the whole thing. That is why I back Brace in his, uh, in his pursuit of absolute dictatorship over the left because he's the only one of the few people I see out there who's got a consistently fucking orthodox Marxist analysis and isn't caught up in uh, absurd, uh, distracting baubles like PMC discourse or whatever the fuck or like campism and arguing the finer points of America's empire vis-a-vis -vis, like uh, emerging... like. Uh, multipolar world like uh, spending all the time on that bullshit because because 
Brace recognizes that the foundation, that the only question now is numbers. That's the only question now. And he gets that, which I don't see many other people. Other people really seem to be thinking like, yeah, yeah, numbers, but what if they're, what if they're Nazis? Or what if they're PMC? Or what if this alienates these people? It's like, that will sort itself out. And I'm not saying that that provides a necessary uh, tactical way forward. It just means that you cannot start from the premise of, of separating sheep from goats. You have to get the widest possible net. And whatever that means, I don't know, but it only comes from accepting that as a premise, which not many people have done. Brace has done it. So I will, I will happily, uh, I will be his, uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of who, which of the old Bolsheviks I would like to be. I saved, I've said Trotsky before, but I don't know. That, that I don't really want to know if I want to end up that way. Maybe uh, Felix Dzerzhinsky, the fucking the angel, the, the blessed, true-believing angel of death at the Cheka, the guy who cried over every list of uh, executions he had to authorize. He said about the check, he said, uh, you know, the only people who do, who do this work are angels or devils. And, they, and uh, the angels have all departed. Do the random humanities grad students on Twitter who call the Belden program fascist have a point? Uh, I mean, the point they have is that they want to protect their little racket. The point they have is that they are terrified of anything that removes the uh, gatekeeping power that they have accrued to themselves, even if it be pathetic. And it is pathetic. It is still, it is a, uh, you know, they, they bind themselves in a, in a nut and count themselves king of infinite bodies and spaces. And they don't want to lose that position. So all that stuff is just is just gentlemen. We got to protect our phony baloney jobs or niches, or whatever pathetic little uh, dunghill they've piled up for themselves on the scrounging for clout on the internet. Let the bodies face the floor. Let the body space the floor. Let the body space the floor. I, I don't know if the building program honestly even is yet, but uh, I'm sure that uh, Brace is in the process of... Uh, of bringing it together. I, on, I honestly assume it will be collaborative to some extent, as it must be, because you know we're all tacking back towards each other after spending years being thrown apart. But I, I have, a, of, all, of all the contenders for the crown, of like uh, of, uh, Lord Protector of the Left, uh, I, 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 I have my most faith in him. Yeah, I think what's going to happen is is that, you know, if we do get there, if we are able to like break out of the structures we've we've fixated and like crack open this this hardened artifice of like discourse, uh, discourse uh, enchanted uh, hysterics on all sides, some people are going to be pushed into becoming what people always accuse them of being, which is, uh, you know, uh, right-wingers. They'll, they'll like, 
form the Tucker Carlson branch of the new Republican Party. For sure, they'll be in there. That's inevitable. That doesn't mean, that's not necessarily bad though because those people were breaking towards where they always wanted to be. Similarly, a lot of people who now are imagined to be of the most left and radical persuasion possible will absolutely crack off and go back to peddling, uh, peddling wokeness within the Democratic Party and specifically within the, the, the neoliberal wing of the Democratic Party. That's also inevitable, and that's fine. And both of them will say, no, I didn't leave the left. The left left me. But it's like, no, bitch. We, yeah, they left you behind because you are remnants of a, of a, it is a snake shedding its skin as it moves off of the online uh, space that it needed to create a sense of self and needed to create like a vocabulary of action, praxis, if you will, that like, could be then replicated elsewhere. But then it has to be shed. It, it becomes more a hindrance than a hate. And I'm not saying that it will necessarily happen. But uh, if anything good is going to happen, it will happen on those terms. No, you're going to lose some people, but I don't think in the context that I'm imagining, where you actually are able to... to, to make the notion of left unity a reality in a way that is threatening to established relationships and like will require repositioning at a fundamental level, people like backing down and admitting they're wrong on significant stuff, that the people who, for whom that's an, an, a deal breaker were never really yours to begin with. They were people who just wanted an argument. And the thing that's going to shake them off is going to be the infusion of new people who will have no time for their bullshit and that will render them less uh, they will get less enjoyment out of it the, their identities as being on the left will mean less to them and they'll be able to reorient themselves towards another identity that is more satisfying but the thing that's going to challenge them is going to be new people and they will be ideally swamped because they were in a sense, not in the sense that they often think of themselves, a hindrance. But this is, of course, all contingent on a new current emerging and finding real grassroots connection. And that is a big if. I'm just saying it's the only thing worth working towards. I don't know, man. October surprise. Isn't it just been nothing but October surprises now? I mean, I think we're so we're so serotonin out at this point. We're so fried spectacle wise that how do you even have a, how is anyone going to even notice if there's an October surprise? How would it be distinguished from anything else happening in a week? Same reason Al Qaeda doesn't hasn't been a terror attacking us for about a decade. Why would you how would anyone distinguish that shit from just background radiation of shit? Trump is hilariously trying to do it with the vaccine thing, which is just so funny, but it's so transparent. Like I said, this isn't going to work the way he wants it to because nobody, even people who like him, trust him on stuff like this. They're like, they might trust his gut. They might trust that he is one of them, but they actually know that he lies all the time and like that he lies all the time because it owns the libs, which is what he needs to do. He lies for a purpose. He lies virtuously. And, and also to... And, and uh, also sadistically, which is one of their virtues. It makes other people unhappy. They love that. They love it. They love it, folks. Don't we love it? But that means that when he says something like, hey, we're going to have a vaccine by the end of the thing, like, they're already like, yeah, sure, buddy. But that means that people who are on the fence also aren't going to believe him. And so it's not even going to get those like waverers who are like, you know what? Trump tells it like it is. But they know on stuff like that, no, he doesn't. But who knows? If he tries, if he pulls out some fucking like uh, sugar water and they start doing like fake vaccination pilot programs, I will. It's just 
I will give the half to tip the cap just for the sheer brazenness of it. That's like Jacob Wall at the presidential level. Well, the late deciders are going to determine it, which is hilarious. Uh, I know that there's a, there's a meme on the left that uh, this is going to be a low turnout election because of how little enthusiasm there is for Biden. And that might be the case, but it would go against the trend of elections since 2016. All, all of the races we've had, almost, or a large number of them, especially lately, even at low levels, even at like state, state race levels, are seeing participation far in excess of 2016. And that would imply that people are more likely to vote, even with COVID, because a lot of these have happened since COVID. A lot of these uh, primaries have, and elections have happened since COVID. Uh, then there's probably, if that trend is, is stable, and it seems to be, more likely that we'll have a high turnout. And I would say if that happens, then Biden will win, and win maybe even on the night in a way that cannot be jimmied. And Trump will sulk and, and maybe make a, a, a play for staying in power, but will be forced to the exits. Uh, because the more people vote, the fewer of them are people who have had their brains just like acculturated into uh, like cottage cheese by the reigning cultural narrative that has dominated uh, uh, the experience of living in this country for the past four years while everything has gotten drastically, horrifically worse materially. And so if you're, if you're coming in to vote, it's probably because, you, because things are really shitty and the president's in charge. And maybe if there's a different president, it won't be as shitty, which is a naive thing to think at this late date in American history. But it's the only reason most people get out and the vote is that they've deluded themselves at some level through either ignorance or through self-hypnosis that it's not too late. Uh, and that actually these elections have consequences. And then you are going to come and you're going to vote for Biden, no matter how much he seems out to lunch, no matter how much he's a Google, he's a goof guy. Somebody says they saw Richard Jules and they don't know why it's good. Well, we're recording the episode on Thursday. We'll, you'll find out then. It's a great movie. Uh, people are going to be mad at us probably for talking about it, especially now with everything else going on. But uh, it's the only piece of artwork, really, of that's like budget or anything that that or profile that I can think of that is actually correctly identifies the dynamic at play within the uh, burgeoning and ma or, or um, ever widening cultural chasm between college educated and non college educated whites, specifically white men. It's, it's the background radiation of so much cultural hysteria and no one really gets it. They can't even explain it to themselves. They can't express it in art. And this thing got it better than anything I've seen. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about on Thursday. Richard Jewell. I did see Sully. Uh, I honestly, after I saw Richard Jewell, I kind of look back at all of his weird sort of lazy, not very good movies he's made over the past decade. we just cranking them out. And most of them are not that good. Uh, I now kind of see them as all sort of taking a stab at the same material. And ju just until now, he hasn't really been able to nail it. And this is really the, that's the home run. Similar in my mind to the way that Mother is the home run uh, at the end of the, uh, Darren Aronofsky's at bat, where all of his movies looking back on them, the good ones and the bad ones, and there are some really good ones in there. I think the, the, the fountain is underrated in IMO, but Mother is just the perfect connection. Everything comes together, and he expresses what he's been trying to express with the closest clarity that you could imagine. So I love that movie. I need to watch it again. Uh, and I think... that uh, Richard Jewell is similar for what Eastwood's been trying to do for the last decade. I, I think he's kind of trying to do the same thing in American Sniper, but he just botches it. It's just too, too suffused with propaganda.
Wrestler was good. I like Black Swan. I know it's very hysterical and, and cringy, but I, that's part of what I like about it is how it's got, like, that's one of the strands that he pulls for Mother is that, is that high, that Grand Guyon unironic sense of hysteria that most directors are too self-aware to put in their work because they don't want to get laughed at. And Mother is super masturbatory, but I still love it. It's a, Among many other things, it's about art, which is masturbation. Right, if all of his movies are masturbatory, then this one, by virtue of being the most masturbatory, is the most perfect distillation of his artistic output. Now, if you don't like that, if you say, yeah, but he's bad, all right, we're on a different wavelength and uh, tip of the ca cap. But I think if you like anything he's putting out, if you enjoy any of the vibe that Aronofsky puts out there, Mother, to me, has to be recognized as just a perfect distillation. Yes, Clint Eastwood, or I'm sorry, uh, Richard Jewell is Clint Eastwood's mother. I liked Under the Silver Lake a lot. I thought it paired very well with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. That's about the way that we are sort of captive to, uh, to the shadows that dance upon the screen. Yeah, 2019's, uh, I think Jesse Hawkins on Twitter said this yesterday. You look back at 2019, that might have been like the swan song for film. You know, it was a strong year. And, uh, and a lot of the movies were about, you know, sort of the majesty of the art form. Like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And, uh, and then it's just a sign that maybe it's time to wrap it up. Not, we're not getting rid of narrative, like, we're not getting rid of, you know, light and sound and all that. It's just moving to the te television. It's just all going to be TV. Even if it's 90 minutes or even if it's two and a half hours, it's still TV. It's TV. It's all TV. And TV is not as good. It just isn't. So we're going to be basically bidding away, bidding adieu to an art form, which it's not, it's not like it hasn't happened before. You know, there are plenty of extinct art forms. Or at the very least, like, you know, exist only as, as niche sub, subcultures. Like, uh, how many people like to sit in a den and look at stereophonic p photographs of, uh, of national monuments? Movies are not just big TV, goddammit. And there'll be some fine TV. And then the TV will eventually be dissolved into social media, which will replace even that narrative form. Eventually, there will be no narrative art forms to speak of. It will be pure uh, social media. We will just be looking at each other. That will be entertainment. And, it will, and there will be no need for narrative uh, architecture of any kind. We're just sh going to be shedding art forms as we go. And it just turns into parasocial relationships.
Yeah, the only art form will be my my vloggings. All right. Uh, maybe one question. Oh man, everyone's mad about the mug. I'm very sorry. Uh, someone asked about aliens, UFOs. I would say more likely interdimensional than interstellar. Because I think we could have a ton and ton and ton of life out there, but there's no reason to assume that there's even a way to get to a societal uh, uh, complexity level to allow for interstellar travel. That, it, um, or, like Kim Stanley Robinson has suggested, um, maybe a society gets complex enough to do that, they wouldn't need to because they would have figured out how to make the planet they're on good enough. And they wouldn't need to go and try to conquer the unconquerable distances. Because they would be able to be fucking at home in the world that they're on. Like, we all need to be. Like, we need to fucking be able to accept this and not always be thinking with that American mentality, that free real estate mentality, that somewhere we can offload all of this pain by finding a new frontier. That's a delusion, and you'll, you will burn out seeking it. If you st a society that is able to check its horrors check its, its, its exploitation before it throws homeostasis completely off and, and destroys the ability to reproduce socially because the relationship between the, human, the species and the fucking planet has been tipped into a, a permanent imbalance. Fucking make this thing work, for Christ's sake. Terraform this fucking planet. And if you did that, then... If you got to that point, it would never occur to you to even try to do that. Why would you have to? Maybe as a lark, you might put some, you know, guys on the Mars for science, but you wouldn't direct your energies that way. So that's another explanation. Um, but maybe, I think if their technology exists to breach one of those things, I think the technology is closer, in my mind anyway, to potentially pop through space time, uh, uh, space, I'm sorry, it seems to me that the technological requirements to pass from one dimension to another are theoretic, I don't know, I'm all, this is all just me pulling shit out of my ass, uh, this is all just hunches, I have no real understanding of science, it just seems to me to me like it's, it's more possible than getting something that can go that far in any kind of meaning, uh, uh, time scale that we could conceive of, it would would be relevant. <clears throat> so if they are there, I think they're there because they can move between the raindrops. Like that's that's what a lot of the people about Skinwalker Ranch seem to think. Like like that experience there. It feels more like kind of a place where there's just a thin membrane for one reason or another, induced or, or natural, where where like there's just passing between is, is, is almost, it's not even in, in net intentional. It can happen accidentally. A thinny in the terms of uh, Stephen King's Dark Tower universe. And if that happens, like just through nature, presumably it could also happen through technological intervention. The Venus shit is interesting. But I mean, it also suggests that maybe, yeah, we could have a lot of life in the universe, but very specific situations have to occur to allow for life to develop to our level of uh, sapience. I mean, it, it could argue, it could be very well argued that it is a evolutionary long-term maladaptation and at most 
the vast, 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 vast majority of species aren't going to get to that point, no matter where they are. Would I have sex with the Venus microbes? Well, that's just silly. Of course. Close encounter of the 69th kind. All right. I'm peacing out. Bye-bye.